questions that are being asked I'd like to mostly address, so this is my preference, is questions that affect how you walk. Questions about living this out. What he's always told me is, tell them that if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, they'll be where they're supposed to be. But you need a teacher to teach you what it is you need to be doing. All right, so welcome to the Zone One for December. All right, so the ground rules for the Zone One. So what we're gonna try to do is get through as many people as we can. So try to limit yourself to just one question. You can always get back at the end of the line and come back and ask a second question. So we just wanna give everybody as many opportunities as we can. For you on live stream, this is just for the local people here, unless there's time between now and 5.30 to squeeze any of you guys off the live stream, and there might be, okay? We are, for all of you that are asking questions, looking for things that you primarily are asking because it will help you in your walk, in your transformation, in your becoming Yeshua-like, not just because it's something that's irritated you forever, not understanding something in the scripture. Okay, we all have plenty of those. I've got those, everybody has those. I want this to be, as all my teachings are, or his teachings through me are all about function. You can use it now to become more like him. Amen? Amen. All right, we'll begin with Brandy. Okay, so the basis for this question, I'm struggling um, from the previous walk where the father was hellfire damnation or la la la, like you describe him. Um, as far as like making decisions, you talk about he doesn't care what color car we buy versus like in the Torah portion yesterday, um, him confirming with Jacob. And I know that was for Jacob, but then he saw Leah wasn't liked and said he opened her womb because she wasn't loved. Where I feel like I know that she had to have the children for the tribes, but it didn't give it as that reason. It gave it as a reason of she wasn't, she wasn't loved, so he opened her womb. Um, not saying that we're going to get confirmations for our decisions, but I think I'm struggling because I'm very, I'm extreme to the right or extreme to the left. And I'm either going to make decisions based on X, Y, and Z and, and doing it with the fruits of the spirit or, and be intentional or just go around, you know, living life, making decisions with the fruits of the spirit and let the cards fall where they may. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right, look, um, when it comes to decision making, you're, you know, I have a teaching, right? It's called making decisions, which is the reason you exist. And so he wants you to make decisions. He wants you to learn to make them with wisdom, which means that you would get through gleaned wisdom, like, like you've read scriptures and you've lived life, so you learned a few things, but also that you might go and get counsel so that you'd have wisdom in your decision making. But these are not decisions that have little to no effect on you or anything, like the color of your car, okay? Now, it might make a difference deciding do I get a new car or a used car and how that might affect your finances, and you might, might need to go get some counsel about that, all right? There are things that are decisions that are connected to this whole car thing, for example, that may fit into the category. The color of it probably doesn't, okay? And whether it's a this company or that company's car probably doesn't either, except everybody has their personal preferences, okay? But whether or not it's a car that will be safe and functional and cost effective and will fit into your budget, those kind of things. So wisdom, okay? And the color of it makes none of that. And those are the kinds of things that I hear people starting to go off into these directions on, things that they want to pray about every little thing that really oppositing back saying, stop talking and make a decision. I want to see you make decisions. Because I want to know how you do that. Because I think you're not understanding this. In, okay, I think maybe you will understand if I paint it this way. Who makes more decisions in the vertical? The people here or here or here or here or here, right? The higher up you go, who's making more decisions? the higher up. So if you're now going to be in a much higher vertical place when he transforms you and gives you the incorruptible suit and gives you maybe 10 cities, he has to know what kind of decision maker you are. 
because you're going to be someone that they're going to come, others are going to come to for help in making decisions. Okay? So don't, don't miss the whole point, which is why, by the way, when you come to me, what, and I said this the other night when we talked about it, when you come to me, the first thing I want to ask you is, what is it you want? What do you want to do? How would you like this to play out? And you look at me like, well, I don't know. I just want whatever he wants. Yeah, but he wants you to choose and then get counsel. And you can always change your mind then, but at least you start off with, this is what I want. And then you may realize what you want really is wanting an error. Okay, fine, but at least you got to start off with what you want. And then he wants to see what you do when you realize it's not the best idea. So he's watching you and your decisions and your choices and how you respond to results of your decisions and choices. Because after all, he's going to give you forever and a lot of responsibility. I don't know what you were told in Christianity or wherever you grew up, but we're not going to sit there just in this sort of uh, stupor of euphoria strumming a harp. You're going to have things to do, responsibility over, lots of projects and things to do, and he has to know that he can hand you these things and that you can handle them. But he also needs to know that if it's something about what you're handling that you have an issue with or a question about, that you'll go and ask appropriately above, wherever you are, go up the line for counsel. And so this whole way that we deal with decisions is probably the most vital thing that you're doing since you're born. Okay? He wants to watch that. Now, he gives you a tremendous help to your decision making. He gives you a manual that kind of gives you the guidelines as to how he would like you to make decisions and what kind of decisions he wants you to make. Does that help so far? It does, but if I can add one more thing. So this came about, I was talking to my aunt who prayed for her, y'all, she close, she close. Um, she was saying, you know, she was looking for work and she was like, well, I guess that wasn't meant for me. And for a second I was just like, oh wait, I have nothing to say to that. And usually I can help and like guide her, you know, not guide her, not teach, you know, but it just got me thinking Lee, when you talk about looking for, not signs, because you don't talk about that, when you're on the path, Leah was saying, oh, my father loves me, no, my husband will love me now because the father's opened my womb. She was looking for confirmation with that, if that makes sense. Okay. So like when we're making our decision and walking our walk, is it okay to look for something like that? Should she have gone and said, no, let me try to fight and get this job or that door closed, let me keep moving. Like I'm no, giving no, not no. enough effort. No, no, you're, you're, well, we're confusing a couple of things together, okay? There is there is A, if you want a job, you may need to go fight for it, but that doesn't mean that B, it has anything to do with him wanting you to have the job or not, okay? We, we're, we're, we're conflating things together that don't go together necessarily. Necessarily, sometimes they do, but we don't know. Look, let's take the Leah thing. Leah wanted her husband to love her. She thought if she had a baby, he would. And so then when she got one, and of course Yahweh said, well, he, you know, she, he saw what her plight was, but now did he give her the baby because it was gonna fix her problem or to show her that it wouldn't? Okay, because it didn't. So he, you know, he doesn't always give you what you want because it's what he wants or thinks is best for you. Sometimes he gives you what you want so you can learn that what, what you wanted, you wanted in error. Wanting the child wasn't the problem. Wanting the child because it would please her husband and make him love her in some way, that was a problem. Okay, now of course she didn't figure that out after the first one, two, three, four, or even fifth one. Okay? She didn't seem to figure it out. But yet, this is, this is how the, so the scripture says that Yahweh knew that she was unloved. Okay, and he wanted to give her comfort. Now, she could have been comforted by the baby, but that wasn't what she wanted. Okay, so we look at the result. So like when a person's trying to get a job and the job doesn't work out, that just means at least on the Peshat simple, the job didn't work out. Did Yahweh cause that to happen? Not enough information yet. Look, any of you remember back in school, right, you had A, B, C, D, and E, and E was a lot of times it's not enough information. Okay, there was like math problems, whatever, and you're missing something. A lot of times we, go, we jump to an A, B, C, or D when it's really E, it's not enough information yet. I mean, he may have caused, he may have just allowed, or it just may have just been time and chance, because we also have scripture telling us about time and chance. 
And so I've had people try to come and move here and then say, well, he must not want me to move here because the doors aren't opening. And you know what? And I have other people that came anyway and everything worked out just fine. You're reading too much into everything. You, the only way to know is really with the, what's, it's horrible to say this, but with the 2020 hindsight. You can only know for sure after the fact. Okay? You can't know until then because you have to see how it actually plays out. All right? Give you an example. I had a job, did great with the job, then all of a sudden it fell apart, got another job. Got another job, everything went really great, fell apart, got another job. This happened for a lot of years. Now, I could have read anything possible into that, but you know what it turned out ultimately? It turned out ultimately that I, looking back now, can say if any one of those career choices I had, which could have been very lucrative, had ever really worked out long term, I would not be standing here today talking to you. Okay? So I can see there was a hand in there, but only looking back after the fact. Not even after the fact of the first one or the tenth one, but after the fact once I came into this and realized, hey, I would have had the big income, the nice house, the family and all that. I would have been so happy, blah, 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 whatever. I would never be pulled into this to do. He pulled me into this when I was in between jobs, unemployed, and literally the day I got fired from a particular job, and I actually fired myself, long story, but I was the one in charge, and I said, this company can't afford half the staff, including me. Okay, so we had to get rid of everybody. That's the day I got called and offered a job in ministry. Okay? So don't try to read so much into each individual event, okay, that happens. You have to be able to look back later to see. Because I've had so many people tell me how this job that they got, ah, oh, but just open the doors. And the next six months later, they hate the job, they hate everything, they've been fired, and it's off. I said, wait a minute, I thought you said, ah, oh, but provided you, and it was just this miracle. Because you're too soon to jump to that conclusion. Don't be so soon. I've seen this with people getting married. I had a lady in the congregation many years ago. I could probably a good 20 years almost. And she tells the story how she met her husband and they had just been married now maybe a year or when, I, when I met her, right? They only married about a year. How she was sitting in this congregation and all of a sudden he walked in and she was like, oh, Abba, for me? And tells how this miraculous story played out and they got married. They were divorced within less than, I don't know, two, three years. Okay? She ended up with a baby and that was it. But the conclusion she jumped to was this was Abba providing. The fruit doesn't show that, though. Okay? Now, Abba may have allowed it because it helped her to learn and to grow in whatever experience she had to go through. But that's, that's, does that help more to understand where you're coming from? It does. But I guess I'm trying to get to the point where it's, we got to be able to make our own decisions. Like, we, yes, we should counsel, but to run in counsel for every little thing, it feels like you can't make your own decisions. I'm not used to that. No. You, but look, we have to have, I guess you're to, saying we have to have the right reasons. When people, when right. I said in the other walk, when I said I want whatever, I did say, like, I want whatever I want. But it meant I wanted whatever my decision was to glorify him. And if learning in that decision is going to glorify him, then so be it. But once you get in there, then how long do you stand? Like the woman you said after six months hated the job. Right. You don't know. And so it's, it's hard. Okay. Let me, let me kind of help. And this is a great question because I think all of you can benefit this. Look, first of all, Deuteronomy 17 helps you know when you should be getting counsel. Okay? And I'm going to loosely sort of paraphrase, but when it talks about when a matter arises that is too hard for you to know what to do. Okay, this is verse 8. All right? So f first of all, you've, you handle most things yourself, and you should make decisions for most things. Some of you come to us for every little thing, and we have to send you away saying, no, you can handle that one yourself. But it should be the thing you really are struggling with, or maybe something you've made decisions in that area before and they've gone badly often enough that you figure maybe this time I might get some counsel. Maybe I should get a little help instead of keeping down that same you know, vicious cycle of making this bad decision. So, so, so Brandy, so first of all, Deuteronomy 17 should help you know what types of things you should go get counsel. It has to be something you really are struggling and you're not sure what to do. Not like, I'm just too lazy to really work at it and figure it out, so I'm gonna go get counsel. And by the way, getting the counsel thing 
is yes, you should be getting counsel and doing what you're told, but you still have to make a decision to do that. So it's not just like, and by the way, some of you have tried this, an elder can tell you that's been tried. People say, well, just tell me what to do. And then when I won't, they get mad. I said, no, you're gonna have to make a decision. So coming for counsel, by the way, doesn't mean that the counsel is going to make your decision. Maybe, Brandy, that helps a little more. The counselor should not be making your decisions. Okay? But I will give you counsel about how to make the decision or what to go do about the process, and that's the things that you need to go do. But we have had, Elder will tell you, several people are like, no, no, don't tell me to go do this. Just tell me what to do. I'll do whatever you say. <laughs> They literally like begging. And we're like, nope. Because that's why he's allowing you to go through this. So you have to learn to make a choice. And so no, okay? I've watched people have, have a real struggle with that. I mean, like where I've told them, look, nothing happens going forward Do you make up your mind what you want. And for two years, they, as far as I know, they still haven't made up what, no, their mind is what they want. I said, so we're not getting anywhere until you make up your mind what you want. You gotta decide. Okay, now, as far as, Brandy, the other part when, like, say, you get the job and you're six months later and everything, all of you, when you get what looks like an answer to prayer, so you're going to put that up on the shelf for observation, <laughs> okay, and you're going to realize and accept it was either caused or allowed. And we're not going to worry which one it was because you're supposed to benefit from either of those. Because if he allowed it, even if it's not the ideal causing, and if he allowed it, and then you go through whatever trauma, experience, whatever it is, you were supposed to grow out of that, learn from it, or whatever it was. He allowed it because it served a purpose, his purpose, okay? Now you just don't know, maybe know at that point what that purpose is, but it's for your growth, ultimately, in some form, okay? So when a door opens, or a door closes, just know that he either allowed or caused it, and that's, Something to say, oh, I, okay, he, look, he closed, the door's closed. Whether he allowed it or not, I mean, I can push on and kick on a little bit and see for sure if it's closed. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's not disrespectful to him. You know, you mean, just go ahead and make sure because maybe that door wasn't really closed. You just had to try and push a little bit, okay? Because some of you put applications in the jobs and I'm like, but did you go and visit them? No. And then you go and visit them and you get the job right away. So you might have to push a little bit. But if a door is really closed, it's closed because either he closed it, or he allowed it to be closed. Time and chance. He said, okay, it was closed. So you move on to something else. Problem is that we're, we're very stubborn. Okay, we're very stubborn. And we're also a very, 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 I don't even know, like, in, uh, that's a word I'm like, I was gonna say incorrigible or something. We, we just have this tendency to conclusion jump. So whatever little bit of information, we're going to jump to whatever worst possible scenario conclusion there is. Well, I guess Albert just didn't want me to move to Cleveland. He might not even have an opinion about you moving to Cleveland. But you're reading stuff in. Albert does not like you to attribute stuff to him that's not his, and he doesn't like the stuff that's his that you don't attribute it to him. So if it's his, give him the glory. And if, you don't, if, you, if it's good, if it's something that you need to give glory about and you're not sure it's his, give him the glory anyway. But when it comes to negative stuff, don't always give him the credit for all that thing. Sometimes it's time and chance happens to everybody. Let it play out. And then maybe later you realize, oh, there was a blessing because this door was closed. All right? Anybody ever get so mad because you, somebody in the family, whatever, made you late getting out of the house, and now you're going down the road on this trip to wherever you're going, it's over an hour away, whatever, and you're all mad you're going to be late now, and then you get caught in, a, in terrible traffic for an accident that maybe you'd have been in if you'd left on time. Anybody have that? Do you ever get that thought? So you see, you're all mad, but maybe he helped you avoid that accident. Okay. Because you go, when you finally get up there, you see there's four or five cars all knocked into each other. You could have been one of them if you had left on time. But see, you don't know. All you know is that you're all mad because you didn't get things to be the way you wanted. Instead of, the first reaction is, okay, um, we're running late. I'll be either caused or allowed this. There's a benefit somewhere in this. I should be calm and relaxed and be okay with that. I'm not happy that we're leaving late, but I'm not going to get all mad either because maybe there's a benefit I'm not seeing to the fact that we're leaving late. 
Maybe getting somewhere later actually has a benefit at some time, at some point. And that's hard for people. It's hard for me. Okay? I'm one of those people who got all mad leaving late and then realized later, wow, I may have missed that accident because that accident looks like it just happened maybe 15 minutes within that, which is probably when I would have left. And so you start to realize these things. Okay, so I think it's really important that we're, we're understanding his expectation for us and our expectations that we should have for him. Our expectation is that we have emunah, which means that everything is caused or allowed. We just don't know which all the time. And it shouldn't matter. Okay? Did that help now? All right, good. All right. See, that's the way I try to answer questions. I keep going until I get the person to look at me and go, okay, now we're good. Okay? Because if we're not there yet, I'm going to keep going because I want you to get the answers that you need. All right. Rocky. Oh, no, Rabbi Tom. Sorry. <clears throat> Thank you, Rabbi. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. <clears throat> I just wonder if you might be willing to elaborate on the difference between tikkun and punishment. And along with that is everything bad or just everything negative that happens to us, one or the other? Um, okay, so when we're talking about tikkun, we're talking about um, adjusting and fixing, you know, something that, uh, from a Jewish point of view, you're, you're, and a lot of them do believe in a reincarnation sort of system, and in that system, you, you're put on earth to, to fix, okay, something in you to fix something that you didn't get, that you made a problem with last time. Okay, so it's about the, the uh, becoming whole, all right? So it's not so much that there's the punishment part, is the, the, you know, the adverse parts of your life are happening in a lot of parts of your life that you need to grow in. And so it's not so much that we should think of them as punishments as areas of gaining our attention, okay? Because if you are paying attention, and I know you're paying attention, right? <laughs> okay, if you're paying attention, then you'll notice that you probably don't suffer in every aspect of your life. You suffer in one or two or so areas, maybe three at the most, and those are the areas where things tend to happen over and over and over. That's the areas that the growth is needed in. Those are the areas that you're being allowed to experience over and over again to finally get the lesson out of it Grow past it so you can move on to something else. Okay? And so that's why you're not, and you may talk to your best friend, and your best friend's telling you about you know, their struggles, and you're like, I don't struggle in those things, and they don't struggle in your things. Or maybe you have one or two that are in common. But you realize people struggle with things that you don't. And you struggle with, struggle with things others don't. That's because they're your struggles. And they're their struggles. And they're meant to help you to get that next level up in your growth. But you can only level up through the experience, through the adversity, through the challenge. And so don't look at these things as punishments, so to speak. Okay, they're not meant to just punish you and make you miserable. They're, they're to get your they're attention getters. Okay, when Yahweh says, and I will curse you seven times, and if you are not instructed by these, he actually says the words that, if you're not instructed by these curses, because the curses are to be instructional. They're not just to be suffering, just to make you be, you know, you pay the price. Oh, you, you made me mad, so I'm going to make you suffer. No, I'm disappointed in your behavior choices, so I'm going to make you suffer so that you make better choices. So it's not just, you know, wanting to cause you pain and suffering. It's adversity with a purpose, okay? So he's going to give you, look, when they messed up how they treated the land, what was his punishment? To throw them out of the land. And so there's a direct relationship to that, okay? There's a direct relationship to that. Okay, which is also, by the way, why... You know, if you have people that are close enough in your life that you could actually listen to, I mean, you know, they can say something and you don't get mad at them, or maybe not that often anyway, <laughs> all right? You may be having a problem with somebody. This is great when it's with your spouse and a child. Doesn't matter if it's the husband or the wife, right? But the husband or the wife is having a problem with the child, 
and, and the child's having a problem with the spouse, and you look at that spouse and you say, that thing that that child's doing to you that's making you so mad, do you have any idea But you do that to me, okay? And so they're looking at you like, I don't understand why that child is treating me this much. Because Abba's trying to get your attention. You're doing to, you do to me, so he's having someone do to you, so you know what it feels like, okay? I think Abba put us here to interact with each other, and then that's where we end up with family members so that we can understand what it feels like to be him, having creatures you brought into existence that don't respect your authority, don't respect you at all, and don't, all these other things ignore you and, and treat you with all this disdain, and yet we have family members who do exactly that same thing. And we wonder, why is that happening to me? Because that's the way you're treating somebody. And so that may again feel like punishment, but it has to do with tikkun, getting you to adjust. The whole point is that you recognize and now fix the broken. All right, did that help, Rabbi Tom? Yes. All right, good. All right, Rocky. Thank you, Rabbi. You're welcome. Hmm. Oh, I'm supposed to relate to how this word is living word in me. And Lot, I can relate to Lot. In, in, in Exodus 19 and verse 16, it says, while he lingered, the men took him by the hand and his wife and led him out. And I've lingered. You know, I've lived, lingered psychologically and emotionally to, to, you know, to get here. It's, it's really been a struggle in my mind and in my emotions. I, I'm so connected to my old home and my old life. And I've been traumatized by that life. I've been, I've been traumatized by the church and traumatized by life and that delusion, that delusion. And I really believe that Lot was also traumatized. I really believe the man who was, had mental in, illness. And I can relate to that. I believe it, the, that he had a substance problems. You know, I used substances enthusiastically for decades and lived in blackouts for decades. And so did Lot. Because in, in, in it also states that in, in, in 19 and in, uh, verse um, 30, when he went to Zor and he lived in these mountains with his daughters and he got drunk one night and, and, and literally had intercourse and couldn't remember it. And there's no man on the face of this earth that's able to get drunk two nights in a row and have two blackouts and not remember it without being conditioned. So that's why I'm saying the man must have had some problems for what it's worth. And then, it, and then in Peter, this really blows me, well, then Peter says in chapter two, and uh, it's in, um, I'm sorry, in verse uh, seven it starts with, he, he calls Lot righteous. So this really blows me away. I'm like, this man was righteous? Like, wow. You know, and, it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and just like when they took him by the hand, just like they took me by the hand, and it says, and I think it's in Exodus, where Yahweh says that he takes the Israelites by the hand and led them out of Egypt by the hand, he took him by the hand and led him out by Egypt to serve him. And this word serve, it means to be a slave to. And I'm going to serve this God who's invisible, but I know he dwells with inside of all of us who absolutely follow his commands and, and guard his commands and, and keep his commands. He said that it has to be true. So how am I going to serve this God that I can't see, I don't know, unless, unless I serve the people? And it has to be that I serve these people through the leadership. And I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to do it. You know, I, I've never been so shook up in my life. I've, I've, the things that I have done, the, the structures that I've built, the, the way I've lived on the edge of, of life, you know, I, some days I used to thought I was going home in a body bag, and I used to like that. But this has been difficult. This has been, I've just spent all my savings to get here, and I'm not even here yet. It's like, really, Yahweh, no matter what I did, it was like, it was backwards. I lost money. Every time I come here, and I had to fix this stupid truck. But I'm going to sit down and shut up. Is any of that made any sense? Sure. <laughs> no, it did make sense. Look, look. Um, living is hard. Okay, it's kind of what you kind of pointed out at the end there. You know, I, look forward, I look forward to being in a body bag, you said. Because at that point, you know, dying would have been easy. Living is hard. Because here's, here's the thing that I want to say to you, Rocky, that everybody would agree with. We're all struggling to figure out what we're supposed to do. 
None of us has this figured out. And so we all can empathize with that comment that you made, that, that trying to figure out, you know, you know when, you're in a, when you're in a drug-induced stupor and you just could care less and just did not exist, there's nothing to, to think about, worry about, or anything, but you, to live life, life has choices and decisions. When you're all blacked out and stupored, there's no choices to make. You're just existing, right? You're just there. And with the chemistry that you put in your body, your, whatever you're experiencing, but you're just there. But then when you're living, then you have everything that's going on around you requires decisions and choices. And every choice you make is going to be pleasing or disappointing to somebody. It's a lot of pressure, okay? Because when, when you're living life, you will likely have at least some expectation, not expectation, understanding or awareness that people that you interact with have expectations, that your creator has expectations. You talked about that. When you're in the, the stupor, you have no awareness of anybody's expectations. You're, you're not even expecting to live. You're just expecting to exist or die. You, you've taken away all of those thoughts and so there's no concerns. Only living beings have concerns, okay? The only people with no problems are already at the gravesite and six feet under, okay? Those are the only people without problems, okay? So you have a choice. You can be there or you can try to figure out how to live because living has problems, okay? Only people without problems are in the cemetery. Go visit them, okay? They got no problems. You have problems because you're alive. And they're not problems, they're challenges to you knowing what to do in a particular moment. You're challenged with knowing what do I do in this situation, in this moment. And that's where all the exciting potential growth comes from, okay? Now, the other part of the emotional stuff that you actually started off with, although you went in a different direction than with Lot, which is this attachments thing, okay? Anything that you're attached to is a really kind of, um, how do I want to word this? It's a mixed bag of opposites. In other words, it's what you love, but it also has the most potential to cause you pain. It brings you the most joy, but has the potential to bring you the most sorrow. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because you're attached to it. So if something happens to it, all the joy and all the positive can go into this really bad negative because of the level of attachment you have. And so the more things you're attached to, like the rich young man that came to speak to Yeshua, he was attached to his stuff. So it was painful to think about giving away that stuff. And so nothing wrong with being attached, but you should be very limiting in how many things and who and what you attach your, your emotions to, you being attached to it. Okay? And so your struggle to leave your old home is because you have attachments. And the people back there are attachments. And a lot of the things that were from that area, they're attachments. And these are naturally evolving and developing things emotionally that we have when we spend time with certain people over time or things that we're doing over time just, because it's a comfort and a familiarity that are the perfect breeding ground for attachment. Okay? Look, you can even get attached to bad things. Okay? There are people in abusive relationships that just can't get out because they're attached. attached. A part of the attachment is not just I love it, it brings me joy. Part of it is that I don't know anything but this, so that unknown is now more fearful than this known. So that's what's going to attach me to it. I'm holding on tight to this because at least I know it. This over here, I have no idea what this is. This I know. I know it's not great. I know that it, it's torturous at times and it's this and that, whatever, but I know it. So now I find myself attached to it. Okay? So you can be attached from that direction or from the direction of this thing is the, my favorite thing. It brings me nothing but joy and happiness and et cetera, et cetera. And you allow your happiness to be connected to a thing or a person. And then if something happens to that, now we get destroyed because you've attached too much to that one item, person, something, okay? So that's why he tells us to love him with everything. 
Because we love, if we love everything else less, the everything else that we love less is going to go away. The everything else that we love is going to either turn to dust or pass away or get destroyed or rust or whatever other words and metaphors are for things that eventually deteriorate and there's nothing. He's the only thing that doesn't go away. So if you can love him more and everything else less by comparison, then you should have less attachments because attachments almost always lead to that sort of bipolar thing. They're so joyful and everything, but they lead to the pain on the other side. Okay? All right? The less, you know, it's amazing how there are people that really get a perspective change who were so attached to so much stuff, and then the tornado comes and takes away everything, or the fire burns everything, and somehow they realize that they appreciate everything that's still around, and they're, okay. you know, yeah, it's sad I lost all that stuff, but... I was much more worried about somebody spilling coffee on my stuff and ruining it than worried about the whole house is gone, at least I'm alive, okay? The perspective changes, okay? Because I've seen people have complete meltdowns because somebody scratched their thing or spilled something on or did this thing with that thing, whatever it is. It's like, it's only a thing. I was one of those people for sure. I had such a problem with things. As a kid, and I broke that by giving everything away that I could. Anytime anybody asked, I just tried to just be generous and give it away. And it hurt in the beginning a lot. Because my stuff, you were better off coming over and spitting on me or punching me than breaking my stuff. If you just damaged one of my things, I would be more mad at you than you came over and kicked me. Okay, I was attached to stuff. It was my stuff. All right? And so, and I have the same problem still to some degree. It's, it's a hard sort of mindset to get control over, to break. There's attachment to stuff, but the stuff is temporary. It goes away, all right? Look, I'll tell you this. This will be an interesting way to put it. Some of you would like to get wealthy someday, okay? Wealth has a lot to do with money. In order to get wealthy, you're going to lose a bunch of that money on the way there. And if you're too attached, you'll quit before you go forward enough because you will lose that thing you're attached to and that you're wanting so badly in the process of getting what you really wanted, which was the wealth. Because you're not gonna get there without losing anything, all right? I remember when I was doing commodities trading, I read a book that interviewed, I don't know, five or seven of the top most successful commodities guys out there, okay? People like a Paul Tudor Jones, some of you may know who that is, if you're old enough anyway, okay? And these guys told their stories of how they got started. And almost every one of them went broke two or three times before they figured it out. And they borrowed money from everybody they knew, went and did this whole thing, lost everybody's money, got everybody mad, and went and borrowed it some more. And whatever they did until they figured it out. Okay? If you're attached to things, Abba will cause them to go away at some point so that you can get freed from your attachments because you can't be attached to those things that way, all right? You just gotta let it go. Recognize, especially when we're talking about things that are actually replaceable. All right, so you don't live where you lived then, but you live here now. It's been replaced. And over time, you'll love this place better than you love that place, but you're just there longer, okay? And so it, there, these are adjustments that get made. You know, I've, I've had a really easy time with a lot of my transitions because I don't get attached anymore to most things, okay? I used to have that real problem. I really don't. So when we've moved, every time we moved, I could care less. People ask me, well, where do you like to, you know, do you care where you live? I can live anywhere because I'm not going to get attached and I don't care. I can do what I need to do wherever I am. Well, do you prefer the city or the country? I don't care. I, as long as I can do whatever I need to do, I can do it anywhere. I don't care, right? This doesn't just mean ministry. Anything that I've ever done in my life it didn't really matter to me where I did it. I did not get attached. But some of you think, well, I need to be in a city. Oh, I need to be in a country. I need, why do you need anything? What you need to do is grow into Yeshua, right? That's what you need. You can do that anywhere. You can do that with any physical things. You can do that without those physical things. You can do it with different physical things. Don't get all attached. All right, Rocky, did that answer the? That part? Okay. Okay, the serving part. Okay, so he says, how, did I, how do I serve an unseen God? Okay, so the answer is very 
simple in concept, all right? This is why he gives you the physical vertical structure. And I think you said that as part of your comments, but I'm just gonna reinforce that. You can't learn to serve the unseen if you don't do that through the seen. Like he says, how can you love you know, the unseen God if you don't love your brother who you see? Because loving your brother is how you practice loving what you can't see. Well, how do you serve the unseen? You have to serve that which is seen. You have to find the right structure and you treat that structure with the same respect that you're practicing as you would treat him, knowing that it's his structure, okay? When people saw Yeshua, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. People saw the apostles. If you've seen me, you've seen Yeshua, you've seen the Father. Okay, so it's, it's that respect vertically going up the line. And so there needed to be that respect. And so if the leadership is anointed, appointed, it's Ephesians 4.11 people, then those people need to be treated like it's Yeshua himself to a certain degree. What I mean, the level of respect. I don't mean like thinking that this person is a Messiah. I would say, but with the level of respect, because Yeshua showed the respect to the Father to show us what that should look like. He says, look, I do anything and everything my Father says, period, that's it, no arguments. Nothing I do is, is, is anything of my own. It's what he wants. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't, he doesn't make his own decisions, but he makes his decisions in the framework of knowing what his father wants. Okay? And so, for you, Rocky, the same thing is, is the servant practicing under structure. Okay? And then the more you learn to treat that leadership of that structure in a right way, that's how you're learning to treat him in the same way. Okay? Ladies, this is the way it's supposed to be in a marriage. Of course, you get, so of course, a lot of the husbands are not in a position that they're earning that very well. They're not meriting that. And so really, I don't want the guys all getting too puffed up when I say the ladies. You, but you, theoretically, ladies, theoretically, you are in a situation where you have a built-in vertical structure to practice with all the time. Okay? Problem is that they're the husband you picked, they're not anointed and appointed. Okay, they weren't anointed and appointed to be your husband. This is the husband you have. All right, so what I'm just saying is when you look at it from that point of view, then guys, you, you want to practice what it's like to be in that structure, know what it feels like to be respectful, then earn it. Go out there and do your part, do your thing. All right, so it's gotta go all, in all directions. All right, now that we catch all the, the stuff, Rocky? Okay, so he said, to be a servant, is, the word there is really the idea of being a voluntary slave. Okay, so let me put that in a right perspective. So it's not that anybody should come here and want to be a slave to the vertical structure, the human vertical structure. What is it that a slave didn't do that you would tend to do? Argue with authority. Okay, a slave is going to not argue with authority. A slave is going to say, sir, yes, sir. Okay? Like in the military, right? You're told what to do, you say yes, and you go and do it. Slaves are not going to argue with the vertical because they would be afraid they were going to get you know, punished for that pretty good. So, so that's, that's more the slave point. Not that you actually are being a slave to somebody, but the slave mentality is that I recognize the fullness of authority. A slave was owned by their authority person. Okay? as opposed to being an employee where you could just choose to go work somebody else, somewhere else. Okay, your boss doesn't own you. You could quit the job today, tomorrow, whatever you, whenever you're, you're always, you could quit your job. But as a slave, you were owned. Your father in the heavens owns you. We, we were bought with a price. Yeshua paid a price. You've been bought and paid for. So you're owned. And now if you're gonna practice what that looks like in the vertical structure with human beings and you're practicing as a slave, I can't sit here and get all full of myself and, and, and be disrespectful and argue and all this other stuff because this is someone representing that owner position, the one who paid for you. Not that the person, the physical person did that, but it's part of the structure. And Yahweh says, as you treat my leadership is how you treat me. This is how you get to practice. Okay, this is how we practice. Okay, how you treat leadership is how you, which is why I tell you, don't be disrespectful of any leadership. We all like to like mock presidents, mock this one, mock that. Stop doing that. It's leadership. It doesn't matter if it's horrendously poor leadership. It's leadership. 
King David had a leader trying to kill him. And he still treated him with the utmost of respect. Okay? There's not a single verse where David is mocking Saul and tearing him down to anybody. He never says a negative word about Saul to anybody. Okay? And Saul was trying to kill him. <laughs> all right? So, you know, let's just keep that in mind. Okay, now that we covered all? Thank you. Good. Good. You're welcome. All right. Good question. All right, Chris. Okay, so uh, the last verse of our uh, Brit portion for this week in Matthew 25, uh, verse 46, um, when Yeshua is talking about the sheep of the goats. And uh, so it says, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. And so I know that you've talked before about how there isn't hell because there isn't everlasting like torturing. And you've talked about how it's the fire that's everlasting and not the actual torture. But I'm in the, with this verse, I'm trying to understand that because uh, everlasting life, well, the people get the everlasting life. Um, so it wouldn't be that the life itself is, is uh, everlasting, but not the actual people living in it. So, and it would seem like with this parallelism that the everlasting punishment would also be some, like, it, I wanted to have you explain that verse. Okay. Would have been easier to explain before you totally mushed it up and convoluted it, but. <laughs> All right, look. Okay, you can't have the one, the one thing be used in both ways. In other words, what's the reward? Everlasting life. What do the mainstream people teach about hell? It's everlasting life and torture. No. Everlasting life, by the way, doesn't say it's going to be a good life, bad life, or joyful life. It just says that you will live forever. Okay, so living forever is a reward. But living forever is also a punishment, apparently, if you look at it that way. Well, that doesn't make any sense. So what he's saying is, here's the contrast. The reward is you get to live forever. The consequence that's, that you get that's the opposite or the punishment is that you get to die and never come back. So the punishment lasts forever. In other words, there's no, right now there are people that are dead that will be resurrected. So that death is not forever. So they're trying to contrast that there's going to be a death that is permanent. And Paul refers to this as the second death. Okay? So he's saying this punishment is permanent. It will last forever. Okay? Not punishing that will last forever. So those that are punished end up in the lake of fire, and then they're dead. And they don't get to come back ever. Those that are receiving the reward receive everlasting life where they get to live forever. Now, does that make sense? All right, good. That's a great question. I mean, that, that section does confuse people sometimes. We have to be careful about what we're applying the words to. So we have the word punishment. What are we applying that to? And we see everlasting life. Everlasting life in torture is still everlasting life. Okay? So you can't take the reward and also make it the punishment. <laughs> Does it make any sense? And look, I'm going to say something, all you Christians out there that are watching, Okay? I want to challenge you with a thought. You're supposed to love your creator with everything. Could you really love, I would not choose to love a being that would torture other beings forever. Why would that make any sense? This is supposed to be the loving God, the compassionate, the merciful. Where is there any of that in torturing anybody forever? Forever is what they're telling you. Like they will be tortured forever. That is a sadistic, evil, that's a Hasatan level thing. So, so why would you believe in, worship, pray to, etc., a God that would do that? And there are gods out there that do that. In other words, the, 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 the false gods, the pay, all those things that other people have, that do those things. But why would you give all of your being, mind, strength, heart, love, everything to a being that would torture people, not for a minute, for forever? Because now we're talking about torture 
Okay, if you are cursed, all those curses that you read about in the Bible last only for a period of time and then people end up being scattered or they die or whatever it is and, the, and whatever curse ends, okay? And those curses are all, as I said earlier, purposeful, right? In other words, they have a reason and that reason is to get your attention so that you might make a positive change. The only reason I can think of to torture anybody forever is because you like it. Think about it. Why would you torture someone forever? There can't be any other purpose. If they can never change, never get out of it, then you're only doing it because you enjoy watching them suffer. Am I wrong? There is no other purpose that can be imagined. I mean, is there really any kind of thing you could do that was so bad in your life that, that it would be worth that they would torture you forever and ever and ever? That makes no sense. Okay, you want to worship that God, you go ahead. That's not the one I'm worshiping. Okay? Because it doesn't make any sense. All pain and suffering, we did this in the evil teaching, is always for a positive end result purpose. And if you're being tortured forever, there is no possibility of a positive purpose. Zero. Nothing good could ever come from it except forever suffering. That's not good. There's no other thing that can happen. So let's finally, I'm not trying to just convince the Christians watching that the doctrine is wrong. I want you to understand that it, it can't be right. It can't make any sense. It's not about technically, well, what does this verse mean? What does this verse mean? You're talking about a sadistic, sick mindset. Okay? To torture people for no other reason than just to cause them pain. And forever. There's no end to it. That's what they're teaching you. There's a much more merciful idea of we're just going to put you in the fire and instantaneous, you're done. There's no more suffering, no more misery. You can stop being this adversary to God. You can stop running off in the directions that only cause you pain anyway and just be done with. That's the example we read in Matthew when Yeshua is talking about, you know, every branch in me. Okay, Matthew 15. And he talks about how the branches that don't stay in him are thrown in a fire and burned like the stubble. You ever throw a very dry, dusty stubble into a fire? Pfft. Burns instantaneously. Okay? That's what he compares things to. I think compare it to being tortured. And so let's be careful with that. I mean, this is the first time I think I've actually really thrown it out there with that clarity, okay? But let's be, he gave us brains, let's be logical and rational beings and use our minds and think. And, and I mean, it, can any of you come up with another reason to torture people forever except that you like it? There really can't be. Okay? Because if it's because it's supposed to rehabilitate them, or they, there is none of that option in there. It doesn't say they'll be tortured until they figure it out and they repent and then they get to, it's just tortured forever. This is, which by the way, didn't exist in any of the early church beliefs until Dante's Inferno when the Catholic Church decided to grab a hold of it. And as far as I remember, Dante's Inferno was not a canonized book. Okay. <laughs> all right, with all the different layer, levels of hell and everything else. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't a world like that and an evil like that, but that's not his. That's another system. That is not Yahweh's. Are there, are there beings out there that would like to torture you forever and they live on it and dwell on it and, and they, they, it's, it's energizing? Yes, those creatures exist. They're just not Yahweh. Okay. So why would you make him to be like that? That world exists. Those beings exist. And some of you have been in those worlds. And you know that that exists. And I feel for you because I'm glad you escaped. Because it's horrible. But you know that that is not Yahweh. You understand that that can't be. You know how opposed and opposite those worlds are. 
because you've been there. So you know that this makes no sense that there would be this punishing forever. That world already exists that wants to live off your pain, live off your misery, live off your lusts, live off all your negative emotions. See, then there's a benefit to the being. It's getting something out of your misery. You want to worship that being? Some of you did back in the past and maybe didn't know it because it pretended to be something else. We know that the devil, if he showed up, we'd think it was Yahweh himself. And the demons like angels of light. They can, they can be pretty convincing and you buy yourself into the wrong system. But just be clear. The creator of the universe is an El compassionate, filled with mercy, <laughs> abundant in mercy. That doesn't match up with torturing people forever. It says, Elohim is love. There's no love in torturing people. So let's be, let's be really careful with all of that. All right, good point. Okay, thank you for bringing it up, Chris. Okay, Janet. Thank you, Rabbi. You're it's just so awesome to be in front of you and receiving all this. And he's so compassionate that he even shortened the time so people who do evil can only live so such a short time and then that's it, right? Um, Look, he gave you a flesh suit for that reason. So no matter how dumb you are and how stupid you are in terms of doing things and all that do is cause misery for yourself and other people, you can only do that for so long. Okay? That's why you're not in a forever suit now. He wants you to figure out and make a choice before he puts that on you. And your choice is to seek that which brings the positive emotions and the positive results and the positive things, the things that are in line with his instructions and his guidelines, not the things that bring pain and suffering and misery. So he wants you to do good and not evil, right? All right, good brings all of the positive things. Evil brings all of the negative things. Okay, go ahead. All right, thank you. So I wanted to go to Bereshit, first chapter. So in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And then it starts to different verses, right? Elohim said, like, let light come to be, and light came to be. And then Elohim said, let an expanse come to be. And then, uh, you know, and so forth. Like, every, everything that he said came to be. So, so since we're kind of created according to his image. So I feel, I think that there's two things there that like probably determine a lot of what happens in our life. Like the pictures, this, this is something that I believe. Pictures, ideas, whatever thoughts that we have in our head and the words that we speak. And I've noticed that if I say something that I do want to come to pass, not like magical, but something good, like a good goal that for instance, something like I'm going to start this new thing or something like that, like a new habit or something, it tends to happen. <laughs> and so the words, I'm thinking about the power of the word and how it can really cause a lot of damage if we use evil words. Obviously, it's huge and you cannot take them back. But also, if we speak like with a good intention aligned to him, it can also be very powerful. At least that's what I've seen. So I guess I'd like you to comment or expand or teach me on that and anything that you can share if I'm seeing this correctly or not. Thank you. All right. Well, I mean, we've got into this a couple of times. The idea of, um, you know, the positive affirmation or the speaking things and then they happen or law of attraction and some of these other types of things that are out there. Look, the bottom line is that words are things. Thoughts are things. They have a vibrational frequency to them, and they actually go out there into the, into the world. Look, if you've been in a room with someone who's very negative, you can be influenced by that energy of that negative. You go in a room with someone who's very positive, you can be influenced by that. Now, the thing is, though, when you say something, we're not magicians, we're not doing incantations, so just saying it doesn't do anything in itself. But saying it over time, often enough, with belief and with emotion, will tend to 
either cause you to behave in a way that's in line with what you're now speaking, or it might, it starts to attract from an energetic sort of level, those things to start to manifest. So it's not like when someone says, you know, I've heard people get mad. I said, you know, I'm not feeling, I'm feeling a little under the weather. I'm a little, I think I'm sick. They go, oh, don't speak that. What do you mean don't speak that? I don't feel well. Oh, don't say that. I rebuke that. <laughs> Stop. Okay. If I walk around all the time saying, you know, I'm just always sick, I'm just always sick, well, that's different. Now I'm creating a mindset and attracting things to that, to be congruent with where I put with my belief system, okay? But just saying something once isn't, you know, the problem, okay? I'm not speaking things into existence. When Yahweh said, let there be light, he had... 1,000%, million percent, whatever, whatever belief that when he said let there be light, light would come into being. Okay? When you say, I've got this new goal or habit, the more you have 100% sense that that will come about and you will achieve that goal or create that habit, the more likely it's going to happen. Okay? So it's not that you're speaking it into existence, but you're speaking a... It's almost like making a value, speaking a commitment in a direction, okay? So it's not enough to just think, hey, you know, I think I'd like to create this new habit. Much more powerful is to say it out loud. More powerful than that is to write it down and say it out loud. So now you've got, you're, you're making these levels of communication commitments. Then when you meditate and dwell on it and repeat it often enough, then you start to reprogram your mind to start moving in that direction. Okay? And these are things that you can learn as far as like understanding self-talk, which we do all the time in self-affirmations and things like that. And they do work very well. And they work because our mind is programmable. The world programs it. Hasatan tries to program it. Father would like you to be programmed onto his frequency, but he gives you the, the information so you can program it yourself. Okay, he's not gonna go ahead and try to program you. The other sources out there are all trying to program you and insert their code into you, okay? Your friends, your family, everybody's trying to write on your code and stick their own code in there to get you to be whatever they think you're supposed to be. And I was like, look, I'm telling you what you're supposed to be, it's right there, read it, you choose it though. You choose to write the code into your, into your code. Right? But then speaking it is powerful movement in that direction. Thinking about it is great. Saying it out loud is even more. Saying it with a belief and a conviction and an emotion appropriate to it, it makes it even more powerful. But if you do that all one time, nothing's probably going to happen. Do that every day for a month, you may start to see some things happening. And not just because they're going to magically happen, but because you're going to have now convinced yourself, programmed yourself, and you're going to start doing little things differently, maybe even, even bigger things differently, that's going to start to bring about these changes. And it'll seem magical to you because all of a sudden some things are just going to start working out. And you don't even realize the subtle differences that you've made in your own choices, in your mindset, in your, in your behaviors that go along with that mindset. All right? Janet, did that help? Okay. Right. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. I kind of feel like that kind of is an intro to my question. Um, we've heard it said, and it's, I don't know, Elder, Elder Billy <laughs> likes to say it, count it all joy. And in reference to in your trials and your struggles, and right. um, you know, he won't put anything on you that you can't bear or... Um, but what happens when you get into a situation where you feel like, is this really of Yah? Is this really a test from Him? Or am I surrounded by toxic people who have now infiltrated me and my being? Not that I wanted it to happen, but it has happened. And now I'm like, unrecognizable to my own self or to my family, um, how do you separate the trial 
of, you know, an experience that you're going through, such as like work, um, to know that it's a trial or if it's something that you just need to put behind you and move on. Okay. Um, good to, Tamara, I appreciate your patience waiting for me to come back over to you and also a good question. Look, the problem is this. It's, it's why are we trying to figure out if something's a trial? Everything, every minute of every day that you're up and awake is part of your final exam. Okay, life is a, the whole life is an exam. So how you handle everything, good and bad, every adversity, every good thing that's, that flows your way. And so, of course, anytime there's more people around, like at work, that is not so much a trial, but everything is a trial. In other words, everything is about him watching to see how you handle everything. 